you need me to open up anything? Okay. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, one of our own is going to be doing our grand rounds this morning, Dan Bettis. Uh, so rather than speaking about uh, unexplained vision loss, uh, which is uh, one of the residents' favorite topics, uh, I'm going to sp speak about a particular patient that I saw, a 46-year-old woman uh, with unexplained vision loss. And this happened in Dr. Katz's clinic. Turn the mic volume up. Oh, here we go. So uh, I'm going to speak about a 46-year-old right-handed woman who presented with a visual deterioration in both eyes. Uh, she actually presented to Dr. Katz's general ophthalmology clinic uh, for decreased vision. Four months previously, she uh, was driving along and uh, nearly hit another car, and uh, so that prompted her to realize that her central vision was uh, highly impaired. Several days later, uh, she was at a uh, a restaurant and was having some difficulty reading one of the menus and uh, actually had to have one of the uh, waitresses there help her. And interestingly, this only lasted about a week and then her vision returned to her baseline. Uh, reportedly, she went to uh, an eye care professional at that time, although no records are available. Uh, she recalls that that exam at that time was normal. Um, she presents because four to five weeks ago, uh, a similar spell started, except this time uh, it's endured and she's having persistent symptoms. Again, it was an abrupt onset, uh, painless, uh, decreased central vision in her eyes. She feels that her vision is washed out uh, during the day and uh, is better under uh, darker light conditions at dusk. Uh, as far as past medical history, uh, she's recently discharged from the hospital for pneumonia. Uh, she was hospitalized four days as part of that uh, admission she was tested for tuberculosis and that was negative. Uh, she has a history of depression and then she gives a vague history of uh, thyroid issues which have certainly never been diagnosed and aren't being treated at the current time. Uh, she's adopted so she does not know her family history. Currently not taking any, medi any medications. She's off of her antibiotics for her pneumonia and has allergies to sulfa. <coughs> as far as review of systems, uh, she does endorse a 30 pound weight loss over the past year and a half. She's gained about 10 of those pounds back um, and she has a vague uh, kind of weak slash uh, pre syncopal episode which was worked up at an outside ER. Again, we don't have those records, but uh, reportedly they did some lab work, um, EKG and whatnot, and it was all normal. Uh, as part of that, she did get a CT scan of the head, which was also normal, which we do have. <laughs> Non-intentional. So as far as her exam, um, She's uh, small. She has a BMI of uh, 16.5. Uh, her visual acuity is 2200 in both eyes. No improvement with pinholing or refraction. Um, no APD present. Mild, uh, mildly elevated intraocular pressures at 24 uh, millimeters mercury in both eyes. Extraocular motility is full. Color vision is decreased, three out of six plates uh, in both eyes. <coughs> and then uh, stereo acuity is presumably, de both of these are presumably decreased because we've never seen the patient before, but uh, her stereo acuity is decreased. Um, she's able to appreciate the fly in just one out of nine circles. But otherwise, uh, her eye exam is fairly unrevealing. You know, uh, anterior segments are clear and quiet. Uh, dilated fundoscopic exam is within normal limits. The nerve looks okay. Um, neurologic exam is non-focal. Uh, we review the CT scan from the outside uh, ER and, and it's normal. So what else does anybody want to know? There's some things that are conspicuously absent from, from the above history. Social history, and that's great. So um, she lives uh, here in Salt Lake. She's uh, unemployed, um, no known uh, toxic exposures, uh, particularly to organophosphates or uh, any some such. Um, she has no new sexual partners, uh, no known sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, she smokes uh, a pack per day since she was a teenager, um, and she has two to three mixed drinks per night. Um, no other IV or illicit drug use. So that's very good. So as part of the workup um, to define these central vision defects, um, 
we decided to get uh, perimetry since her vision was so decreased we decided to do gold mine perimetry um, so uh, here you can see uh, that there are uh, fairly dense uh, seco central um, areas of, of vision loss um, pretty characteristic pattern while well, uh, the the the, the uh, peripheral vision is relatively uh, preserved so what's the differential when you start to see uh, central or uh, central uh, central sequel or seco central scotomata so uh, one thing on the differential has to be a, a maculopathy, which uh, the patient denies a lot of the, the uh, concomitant symptoms that should uh, accompany uh, maculopathy, like metamorphopsia, night blindness. Our patient said that uh, it was actually better at dusk. Photopsias, um, macular photostress, or delayed glare, glare recovery. Um, so while that's a possibility, uh, she also had a normal exam, and uh, I would say it's lower on the list. Neurologic causes. So. Uh, of impairment of the optic nerve uh, can be mitochondrially inherited. Uh, labors uh, could present in a very similar fashion to this. Um, there could be a dominant optic atrophy, um, uh, which could uh, typically presents a little earlier in life than this. Uh, you can always think about demyelinating disease in particular that could have been missed on a CT scan, which he had at the outside ER. Um, compression or infiltrative. Uh, disease of the optic nerves, which should have been picked up uh, in part by the by the CT scan, syphilitic optic neuropathy, and then uh, toxic or nutritional optic neuropathies, in particular, uh, particular B vitamins, uh, certain drugs like methanol. If she was uh, she denied any moonshining or or home cooked uh, cooked uh, booze, but um, uh, she also had uh, not been on ethambutol. They did not treat her for for. TB when she was in the hospital, they simply tested her for uh, tuberculosis. And then uh, lastly, uh, tobacco, alcohol, amblyopia. And uh, in this particular woman's case, that was the presumptive diagnosis or the working diagnosis was uh, tobacco, alcohol, amblyopia, or nutritional optic neuropathy. <coughs> um, we also got uh, VEPs, uh, which you can see are, are uh, mildly delayed in both eyes, the right eye uh, more than the left. And the plan was to check a, a CBC, a folate, a B1, a B12, all of which were within normal limits. Uh, she was counseled regarding smoke, smoking cessation um, and alcohol abstinence. Uh, she was started on coenzyme Q10, uh, which as you know is uh, designed to boost mitochondrial function. We'll talk about why uh, that's important in a moment as far as the, the, uh, the pathogenesis of the disease. Uh, she was also started on antioxidants, vitamin C, vitamin E. And then vitamin B12 supplementation, which is an important part of the management of this disease. In addition, she was uh, very impaired by our, her, her visual function, and so we referred her to uh, Julia Kleinschmidt and also to Low Vision, who were able to help her quite a bit. So this patient is interesting. I actually saw them in, in follow-up with Dr. Uh, Katz, but um, we have quite a bit of follow-up, so I'm going to go through some of her follow-up visits. <coughs> um, at six months, the patient felt that her vision was variable uh, from day to day and even within the day, but overall stable. She enrolled through classes, uh, through the in classes through the Department of Services for the Blind. Um, at six months, her vision was uh, overall unchanged, maybe a little bit worse in the right eye. Um, intraocular pressures were. She she did stop smoking. She was she able did. to stop. You know, she was able to stop. She uh, stopped drinking altogether. Uh, we'll see how long that lasted uh, here in a bit. But um, her color vision remains impaired. Her stereo vision remains impaired. Um, and uh, the only change on uh, slit lamp exam is that there's now a mild pallor of the temporal uh, optic nerves, which was not uh, noted on initial presentation. And here's her um, perimetry, which is almost identical uh, to when she presented. A year and a half later, uh, she says her vision is about the same. This is somewhat ungratifying, you know, to ophthalmologists uh, because, you know, you can see she's uh, seeing 2040 plus and at 2020 minus two. Uh, <laughs> um, she does have a new diagnosis of Graves' disease, uh, so this uh, kind of vague uh, thyroid difficulty that she had initial, initially was, was uh, came to fruition and she's status post thyroid ablation. Uh, color vision remains almost exactly the same. Her stereo vision is maybe a little bit worse. And again, her dilated exam is unchanged. So, so one, one thing on that last that, that I think we often forget is we're so focused on the smell and visual acuity in regards to overall function that that is a, that, that is, that is a, a very high contrast visual function where most of life is not. You're right.
how often you go around in large rooms, so everything is a is is, is a, a stark, well lighted black object on a white background. Right. That's a very good point. You know. And, and, That's very important. Also, also um, important, and, and most of us do a good job of this here, is, is to note, make sure that uh, we're noting whether the patient's looking eccentrically or anything like that when we're noting the visual acuity, but those are all very excellent points. And finally, at, at five years, you know, and this is most recently, so uh, she notes no changes to her vision. Uh, she has resumed smoking, you know, um, half a pack per day, uh, two drinks per week. Um, Fortunately, she is back up to maybe a more of a, a normal weight range, so she's back up at 25 pounds, so she's gained back nearly all that she lost unintentionally. Um, she's finished classes at the Blind Center and is now a volunteer at the Literary Center. And her vision is, uh, her snow and visual acuity is, is grossly unchanged from before. And then um, we felt like her, her vision was uh, improved enough to where she could perform uh, standard automated perimetry, and so that's what you see here. Again, verifying that there's. Um, so you just look at that. How in the yeah. heck can you gain 20, 40 grams? Yeah. 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 <coughs> so. Well, it was a little off. Maybe. Yeah. So we'll talk about tobacco a little bit. Um, it's widely accepted that Christopher Columbus, you know, when he came, he, he was one of the first non, uh, person not from the Americas to see the tobacco plant. Uh, in fact, you know, some of the early explorers noted some of their interactions with uh, the indigenous people. And, uh, they noted that some of the shamans of uh, Hispaniola and certain Central American provinces poisoned themselves with tobacco smoke during a uh, curing seance. You know, perhaps that's a, um, a premonition. But the vast expansion of tobacco use really occurred during uh, the 16th century or the 1500s, you know, um, where a, a gentleman named Jean Nico, who sent some powdered leaves to uh, Catherine de' Medici, and if you uh, know that de' Medici held no small amount of power during that time uh, for her uh, incurable headaches, um, they worked uh, and it gained quick popularity and it came to be called uh, the herb of Nico, which is, of course, a derivation of nicotine today. Um, <coughs> Today, or at least in 2011, which is uh, the CDC data for 2012 hasn't been compiled yet, but uh, in 2011, 45.3 uh, million people in the U.S., or about 19% of all adults in the U.S. smoke. Um, we actually have the lowest rate of smoking here in Utah, which is 9.1%. Um, and cigarette smoking at large, you know, not just speaking about vision, is, is a big um, public health problem. Uh, accounting for approximately 443,000 deaths, or one in five deaths in the U.S. each year. Uh, perhaps it's not lost on those in the young, uh, audience that about one in every five deaths is due to nicotine, and about one in every five adults smokes. So, um, tobacco and, and vis impaired visual function have kind of a long history. So, uh, the first relatively modern report of tobacco-induced optic neuropathy was uh, by Joseph Beer, who is not uh, studying uh, tobacco, alcohol, and deopia. Uh, in the early, uh, he was an early European ophthalmologist in 1792. It appeared in uh, a couple different texts at the time, um, one by William Mackenzie in uh, 1833, and then by John Lee Sars, uh, The Use and Abuse of Tobacco in 1859. Uh, described visual deterioration in amaurosis as common consequences of smoking tobacco. And one of the most interesting accounts I found was by Charles Drysdale, um, in 1875 where he reported some of his experiences with uh, tobacco poisoning. He's, he writes, one of the symptoms produced in acute poisoning by tobacco is blindness a cr and chronic poisoning gives rise to similar symptoms. In one week I saw two cases of tobacco amaurosis in young men. The first had chewed continually and the other smoked the enormous quantity of one ounce of shag tobacco daily. Both were completely and irretrievably blind. So its place in history kind of continues, and this is one of the things that I found very interesting about this disease was um, how it continued to crop up, you know, particularly in wartime. Um, 
So in Havana during the Spanish-American War in uh, 1898, uh, there was an, edemic, uh, an epidemic of optic and peripheral neuropathy. Uh, not very well studied at the time, uh, but two more which are better studied occurred. One uh, during uh, World War II in Southeast Asia among prisoners of war. Um, they noticed uh, asymmetric vision loss in some of the POWs you know, several months after capture, especially in those who uh, were malnourished and forced to exercise. Um, they had associated peripheral neuropathy, bilateral nerve deafness, uh, painful superficial keratopathy, and smoking was very common at the time, um, and tobacco use was implicated in some cases. Early dietary they found that early dietary supplementation, especially with B-complex vitamins, uh, led to a good visual recovery. You know, one thing I'd like to point out at this point, you know, is the constellation of other neurologic symptoms points to perhaps other underlying nutritional deficiencies, you know, particularly, you know, dry beriberi from thiamine deficiency and the like. Um, and then finally, uh, probably the best studied uh, occurred in 1992 to 1993 in Cuba, again, uh, where greater than 50,000 individuals uh, were found to have a bilateral optic neuropathy. This is when uh, they had an acute downswing, you know, in the economy. There were, uh, you know, famine and malnourishment was rampant at the time. Um, they had other neurologic symptoms, as we saw in, in Southeast Asia, including peripheral neuropathies, myelopathies, spastic paresis, uh, deafness, uh, all these in various combinations. They did a lot of uh, epidemiologic studies uh, on the, these uh, patients, and they found, you know, wide age range, age range uh, male predominance, and uh, they looked further into the use of tobacco and, and by what means uh, the people did consume tobacco, and they found that uh, vision loss was particularly associated with cigar smoking and also pipe smoking as opposed to uh, cigarette smoking. Um, they also found that it was uh, associated with weight loss and also increased cassava intake. So cassava is almost pure carbs, you know, it doesn't have a whole lot of protein, but also uh, it, it contains naturally occurring uh, cyanogenic glycosides, uh, glucosides, which poisoning has been well described, you know, with, with a lot of cassava, and we'll talk more about uh, the proposed pathogenesis of tobacco, alcohol, and bleopia in a moment and talk about why cyanide might be important. And uh, they noticed uh, a partial to complete recovery in these patients in Cuba with uh, parenteral and oral vitamins. So uh, to speak about nutritional optic neuropathy, you know, <laughs> many have proposed this change in nomenclature, you know, even though we're still used to hearing tobacco, alcohol, and bleopia, just to underlie you know, uh, obviously we see a lot of patients who drink and who smoke uh, who never get any vision loss, and so uh, many have proposed that uh, this underlying nutritional deficiency plays a large part, and so they have proposed putting that into the name. Um, typically affects heavy drinkers and smokers who are also deficient in protein and B vitamins. Uh, males are more affected than females, and again, as I already pointed out, it appears more common, particularly with uh, cigar smoking or pipe smoking. Um, the pathogenesis at this point, you know, remains fairly poorly understood as far as things go, but it's likely multifactorial uh, with uh, underlying genetic susceptibility overlapping with to toxic environmental influences. This has been particularly difficult to parse out, you know, one because of uh, the ethical difficulty in putting together randomized control trials, um, but also with trying to parse out people who do tend to smoke and drink uh, at the same time, so you can't really take the two apart. Um, it has been proposed that smoking in genetically susceptible patients might affect sulfur metabolism, which is very important in uh, the detoxification of cyanide, leading to a chronic cyanide intoxication and deficiency of vitamin B12, you know, and this uh, may be collaborated by that, um, that observation that they had in Cuba with the increased cassava intake. However, in most of these patients, including our patient, uh, a specific vitamin deficiency is rarely found. Um, at times, it can be barely below uh, the normal limits, you know, and certainly not a profound uh, deficiency of a vitamin. And so uh, many have proposed that there's a relative deficiency of a vitamin, um, and in particular, there may be a relative deficiency of multiple B-complex vitamins working in concert. And so um, they recommend, you know, treating uh, all of those vitamin deficiencies empirically. Given the similarities, uh, as we pointed out in the differential uh, of the um, presentation to uh, labor's hereditary optic neuropathy, um, many have proposed whether there's an uh, impaired oxidative phosphorylation and uh, mitochondrial 
energy production, which would be that predisposing genetic factor uh, to these patients who smoke and drink and developing optic neuropathy. Now, interestingly, this was studied during that Cuban outbreak. They actually looked at uh, mitochondrial DNA haplotypes, and they were not able to find any association. You know, to my knowledge, that's the largest study uh, in this regard, and, and certainly it's open for more study, but uh, to, to date, this has not been found to be true. One of the interesting things, you know, this was very, very common, you know, uh, even 100, 200 years ago, at least it was a commonly uh, evoked diagnosis, and it's been uh, decreasing in incidence over the years. And so a number of authors have commented on this as to why this could be. Could this be because we have, in general, better nutrition, you know, nowadays than they did, you know, 200 years ago? Um, could it be due to a change in tobacco consumption, whereas more people are uh, smoking cigarettes as opposed to cigars or shag tobacco in, in pipes uh, versus an initial misdiagnosis, you know, um, 200 years ago, labors didn't exist, you know. Um, a lot of a lot of multiple sclerosis didn't exist. All, all these uh, causes of optic neuropathy or, or decreased central vision loss uh, were not understood entities. And so if a patient shows up with decreased central vision loss, you know, they're smoking a pipe then, uh, and drinking, then maybe you just call them a tobacco alcohol amblyopia. And this is just an interesting um, graphic that I found just talking, uh, just kind of illustrating uh, the change in tobacco consumption. So the solid line is the increasing use of, of cigarettes and then uh, the dashed line uh, representing um, the other forms of uh, consumption of tobacco. So briefly, you know, part of why I wanted to talk about this was I felt that the historical um, background was very interesting and two, I wanted to refresh our collective memories about this disease because uh, it is so rare. Um, so to summarize, uh, the presentation is much like our patient, you know, an insidious um, onset of bilateral symmetric visual impairment with associated uh, decreased color vision, um, particularly red and green uh, color vision. Um, and the signs are often subtle as they were in our patient. Uh, on presentation, we weren't able to see anything on biomicroscopy, but um, there may be subtle temporal pallor, splinter disc hemorrhages, mild disc edema. This has been described in literature most recently as people are using OCT on these patients. They'll find that maybe there's some thinning temporally, but then the rest of the optic nerve head uh, remains mildly swollen, you know, which uh, they have proposed is due to the underlying metabolic injury. Um, as we saw, they can have uh, a number of visual f field defects, uh, but the most classic being a bilateral symmetric secocentral uh, scotoma. Um, in our patients, this may be easier to plot uh, using a red target than a white target. Um, and then treatment um, predominantly is, is, is based on, uh, on nutrition and, and um, lifestyle modification. So um, we treated our patient orally, uh, but uh, some have proposed uh, using weekly B12 injections for 10 weeks, uh, a multivitamin including um, B complex vitamins like thiamine and folate, well balanced diet, and then uh, absolutely abstaining from uh, tobacco and alcohol. Understanding that this may be one of the most difficult parts for our patients uh, in the treatment of this disease. Uh, it's become clear in the literature that abstinence from smoking is more important than abstinence from alcohol for visual recovery. Uh, perhaps coming back to some of the proposed pathogenetic uh, mechanisms that we already discussed. And then it's important, you know, if you do find a vitamin deficiency to rule out other causes, you know, for that vitamin deficiency in particular, if uh, you find a deficiency in vitamin B12, uh, you, you need to, to look for, for pernicious anemia, and sometimes we may need the help of our, our colleagues in that. Um, as we saw with our patient, the prognosis is good. So. Uh, for patients who are seen early, you know, provided they can comply with treatment. Although that visual recovery may be slow, you'll recall that in our patient, uh, we didn't appreciate um, uh, increase in the snow and visual acuity until 18 months, you know, after uh, the initial insult. And, um, and Dr. Olson makes a very good point, you know, that, that even though we feel good and pat ourselves on the back about the visual recovery in our patient, they may be left uh, do with uh, quite a bit of functional impairment due to uh, the color vision loss and, and uh, decreased contrast sensitivity. Unfortunately, you know, if these patients come to us uh, in advanced state, there may be, you know, permanent vision loss due to atrophy from the optic nerve. Um, 
and so they, they have a more guarded prognosis. Oops. So in summary, um, we should think about uh, nutritional optic myopathy in our patients who present with gradual painless progression of vision loss, particularly in those who have sacrocentral uh, field defects, uh, which indicates a dropout of the uh, metabolically active uh, papillomacular bundle, temporal pallor of the optic nerve. And in the work of these patients, uh, make sure you check for vitamin deficiencies, in particular B12 and folate, rule out pernicious anemia, rule out compressive lesions with a CT or an MRI. And then always think about labors, you know, uh, particularly if there's a family history, which our patient wasn't able to give since uh, she's adopted, but if there's any form of family history, if they present a little bit earlier in life, you may think about dominant optic atrophy, particularly with a, a, a family history. And then again, think about uh, labors if you do see, you know, particular signs on, on physical examination, you know, particularly telangiectasias about the optic nerve. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, so last year I gave a grand rounds the day before my son was born. Um, and so this is the picture that you got to see at that time. And uh, so now he's uh, 14 months old. He loves new news, as you can see here. And uh, he also likes to play doctor from time to time, but no pressure, no pressure. So thank you very much. Bryce. That's a very good question, Bryce, <laughs> and one that I don't know the answer to. You know, in my in my reading for this presentation, I did not come across you know what was a safe amount of smoking. You know, I think that, and perhaps other people in the room know, but you know, particularly, I think we should counsel complete abstinence from smoking, particularly if we do feel that it is related to their vision. <laughs> yes. So, so the epidemiologists.
Mr. Terry. That's great. And, you know, and we're fortunate to have excellent, you know, resources here uh, at the university for helping our patients to quit smoking, you know, but it's important for, for all of us, you know, particularly if we're going to be practicing elsewhere, to find those resources to be able to provide the patients when they come to us. <coughs> Dr. Warner. Yes. Onset, you're right. That's a good point. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it was uh, prisoners of war in in, yeah, yeah. War in Southeast Asia. Southeast yeah, Asia. that's right. Mm. That's right. You're exactly right. It was a terrible economic time. Okay, thank you.